Coming up on Theater Talk. So what do you find when you go from your, your extensive theater background, suddenly you're thrust into Hollywood and the movie business and the dynamic of the movies? Where ah, you... decadence. <laughs> <laughs> theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm the producer, Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. So, Michael, I have to confess that in spite of the fact that they talk about you a lot, I am hooked on Smash. Absolutely. It's wonderful. <laughs> and I watch it every week, and so I'm very happy we're going to talk about it tonight. Yes. Um, as producers, Craig Zayden and Neil Marin helped reinvent the movie musical with Chicago and Hairspray. On Broadway, they have brought back hit revivals of Promises, Promises and How to Succeed, currently starring Nick Jonas, I believe. And they have taken Broadway now to television for NBC's Smash, and I am delighted that they are joining us tonight. Welcome, Craig Zayn. Well, thank you. Thank Neil you. We're Mary. glad to Welcome be here. Very and let me also put a plug here. in for uh, an old book that Craig wrote. Oh, yes. Sondheim and Company. There have been many, many Sondheim books over the years, but I tell you, this is really still the best one. So if it's still oh, in print, is you. it, Craig? It's it is, and you know, we're actually talking about making it an e-book. Oh, great. Right. So that people can get it, you know, on, on the internet. So we're, we're working that out for the next couple of months. It will happen. Terrific. Well, I'm going to talk about this book in a minute. Oh, so. thank Definitely. you. All right, gentlemen. Um, I, no secret that I love Smash. Uh, the pilot. <laughs> <laughs> surprise, really? surprise. It's, uh, I've been unbelievably insulted in that pilot. <laughs> um, and, uh, but you I, agreed to it. I absolutely agreed to it because I think uh, turnabout is fair play in this business. <laughs> um, and I've been following it as Susan has and enjoying it very much. Um, but it's, it's true that the ratings have fallen off a little bit, and that concerns mm -hmm. me. How do you guys feel about uh, where Smash is now with uh, the viewing public? You know, we expected there to be a, a fall off after the premiere because that's only natural what happens. Mm -hmm. It's just something to be monitored and to uh, to keep on trying to do the best show every week that we can. Mm -hmm. yeah. and I mean, the marketing campaign always for every new show is to get people there the first episode. Right. They sample, mm -hmm. and then those that decide it's for them stay, mm -hmm. and those that decide, oh, I don't want to see this show, don't come back. Right, right. So... It, the, you expect that to happen, and it's happened exactly as planned. Do you ever have a situation where, uh, as a show moves along, that water cooler talk kind of heats oh, up? Oh, absolutely. About it, and then sort of people yeah. dip yeah, in, I mean, and, and it begins to yeah, rise again. It, it becomes kind of a zeitgeisty thing with this kind of a groundswell after enough episodes have aired, and people start talking about, oh, did you see what happened on Smash last night? Right. You know, it kind of drives viewership. And so that's what we're counting on happening. Right. And that happened with Glee, too. Really? I mean, when Glee started, it was sort of all over the place. And then all of a sudden, um, it started growing and growing and growing. Mm -hmm. And uh, depending on the week, right. it yeah. either goes up or down. I think yes. But you know what, what, what Steven Spielberg and Teresa Rebeck and, and the creative team tr are trying to do is something that hasn't been attempted before. Right. So, of course, you know, I think word has to get out that it's something that is a great entertainment to watch. Now, what aspect hasn't been attempted before? Uh, doing an original musical as the basis of a TV series. Right, right. And that's something new, to see the evolution of a Broadway musical. Right. Any other show that's used music has had cover tunes only. Right. And, you know, Mark Shaman and Scott Whitman are out there writing a new song every single week. At least one. Now, I can't imagine people watching Theater Talk haven't seen Smash, but for the two of you who haven't, <laughs> um, it, it, it follows the development of a Broadway musical about Marilyn Monroe. Mm -hmm. and you see the writers, uh, played by Deb Messing and Christian Borel, mm -hmm. and the producer, uh, uh, brilliantly played, I think, by Angelic. Brilliantly. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, who, Your uh, co-star. My co-star. <laughs> <laughs> It's interesting because when Angelica finished our scene, she said to me, she said, you know, I learned a lot about acting from Jack Nicholson, but I learned even more from you. <laughs> yeah, and I said that to uh, your friend Rob Bartlett, who's in How to Succeed. He said, yeah, she learned what not to do. I said, that's pretty much it. <laughs> she, she, was, she was very impressed with your naturalism and your charm and all the qualities that we love. All right, you can cut that out, Susan. <laughs> um, so what is it that got you thinking about doing a TV show based on our kind of little insular Broadway world? Well, the peculiar thing is it really came from Steven Spielberg. Hmm. I mean, Steven, it, it all started one day. We got a phone call from Spielberg's office saying, 
on a Friday saying, can you come in on Monday and meet with us at DreamWorks? Mm. And you wait, you know, your whole life. You say to yourself, what would happen if we got a call from Steven Spielberg? And we did. So we went in. We had no idea what he wanted. We went in and he, we sat in his conference room and he came in. And uh, he's, he's really amazing because he's very childlike. He has this, like, boyish energy. Hmm. And you understand why he is who he is once you spend time with him. Mm -hmm. And he's, he's so much fun and, and very creative, of course. And he said, okay, I, I, I have this idea. I wanted to do it for a long time. And I want to do behind the scenes, upstairs, downstairs, of the making of a Broadway musical. And, and it's going to be this, this, and that. And he outlined the whole thing in, like, three minutes. And then he got up and he said, so you'll do this with me, right? And we went, uh, okay. yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> you know, it, arms, it was one of those dream moments right. that, that, you, that you hope happens in your career. Now, is Steve Sondheim a secret show queen? Does he know all the old shows that we know? And say, Steven well, Spielberg? Steven, I'm sorry, Steven, <laughs> Steven Sondheim. Yeah, I, think Steven Sondheim. <laughs> I think you'll cut that. <laughs> no, is Spielberg a secret show, show queen? Does he know he all the songs that we all know? He's a gigantic fan of Broadway musicals. Really? Absolutely. Never, never, he never loves never Broadway loves musicals. Hmm. And also, one of his, I think, I wouldn't say frustrations, but I'd say... Um, one of his quests in his career. He's, he's done everything mm -hmm. except direct a movie musical. And he wants to do it. He wants you know, to And we've had conversations movie. on and off over the years about doing that. About doing something. Well, how about this, guys? You are also Broadway producers. What about Steven Spielberg directing a Broadway musical? That we haven't discussed with no, him. We but, haven't. you know, I think he, if he understands the theater as well as we think he does, he would, and he's accomplished so much in his career, why not? Yeah, yeah. That's interesting, though, because I think, remember when Blake Edwards came to direct Victor Victoria? Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you have to be a little, a little yeah. cautious about that. I remember uh, somebody telling me at the time out of, in Chicago where you and I went to see the show, mm -hmm. oh, God. and Blake Edwards would say things like, um, cut, <laughs> <laughs> or I'd like a close-up. I'm not really making this up. That was, he oh, didn't, know, didn't know yeah. the language well, of that, the That's exactly right. I mean, there are two distinct languages to theater, one for theater and one for film and television. Right. And the artists that we look to work with know both languages. Right, right. Let me ask you guys, you, um, you both started out here in New York in the theater. Mm -hmm. uh, do we, doing what, doing what, Craig? I started really as a journalist. Yeah. And I wrote for New York Magazine and other publications. And then from that, got to write the Sondheim book. Mm -hmm. And from that, uh, Neil and I met because there was the heyday of the cabarets in New York. Right, right. And we got, we got asked to produce and direct and write cabaret shows. And, and, and we did. And from those shows led to Joe Papp seeing the shows that we had But done. the shows that we did was a series of shows that featured the works and, in addition to their works, the actual people of Broadway composers and lyricists, such as Sheldon Harnick and Charles Strauss and Harold Rome and Andrew Lloyd Webber and Tim Rice, mm -hmm. and even people like Hal Hackety and, and okay. Larry Grossman, yes, you know, yes. so we as Stephen Schwartz and yes. Kander and Ebb. So were they we got, writing original songs for you in these? No, no, no. We oh, were presenting their careers. We were, we were basically presenting their songbooks. And this was before the age of the shows that featured songbooks of these famous composers and lyricists. But we decided to do it about these Broadway composers and lyricists and basically work with our heroes. And were you, were, what, what little, what theater? It was, a, it was a little club in Soho called The Ballroom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the series was beautifully called Broadway at the Ballroom. <laughs> we also we debuted songs that they were working on. So when Charles Strauss did his week, uh, we performed uh, Tomorrow, because mm -hmm. Annie was out of town. Oh, right. So it was that, sung the first by time Annie was heard in right. New That's York right. Publicly. It was the first time. And it was sung by Laurie Beachman. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. It was yeah. Laurie Beachman. Laurie and then Beachman. Andrew Lloyd Webber debuted Don't Cry For Me, Argentina, because they had just finished writing Evita. One of the best shows I think that we did was with the lyricist Carolyn Lee. Oh, oh, yes. Yeah. And that was magic. It yeah. was magic. Yeah, yeah. She was such a character. Oh, tell us. I love Carolyn Lee. Oh, I mean, uh, there was there was <laughs> like a, the, the, she was this magical person, who was brilliant. I think her lyrics were extraordinary. Uh, absolutely. And we became we all became very good friends from this thing, and you know she would call us like in the middle of the night and say. 
I was just lying in bed and the bed collapsed and I don't know what to do because I can't get up. <laughs> she, she was kind of a plus sized woman. <laughs> yeah, she, was, she, was, she was a little, little large. And, and it's like, well, what do you want us to do? I mean, you want us to come over and pull you off the floor? You're a, yeah, that's what a producer does, right? <laughs> Isn't that what a producer Absolutely. does? Comes over and pulls the talent off the floor? Exactly. exactly. You learn exactly. very quickly. Yeah. They call your neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> There's a great story about Carolyn Lee and Martin uh, Godfrey's biography of Bob Oh, Rossi. yes, Little Me. Little me, yes, and they're out of, of town, and, she, uh, yep. and they cut one of her songs, or they yep. cut a lyric, and she's furious, and she walks out. I think she calls the police. Yes, yes she, she did. did. The police she, comes. Comes. She, did. she walks out, and she looks at Fosse, and she says, arrest him! And she looks at Neil Simon and says, arrest him! She looks at Psycho and she says, and leave him for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, more than urban legend. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah, all good. true. So, so that's how you really began. And yeah, that's how we began, and then Joe Papp came to see a lot of those shows, and and called us out of the again out of the blue like the Spielberg call he called and said I've seen your shows at the ballroom and would you come over and have a meeting mm. and we thought oh my god what what does he have in mind it's Joe Papp thank Joe you Papp. Yeah. Joe Papp. Papp. Steven Spielberg for you back in those that, days that's right so we went over we had a meeting with him and he said you know like I really want you to come over here and let's work, come work at the public theater mm. And we were dying. We just thought, oh my God, this and is And he amazing. wanted us to create new musicals. Wow. Yeah. What did you, so what did you do with So them? basically, what we were fostering were the development of shows like I'm Getting My Act Together and Taking oh. It on the Road mm -hmm. and Runaways. Mm. And then mm -hmm. we also brought plays and identified plays for, for Joe to do at the public and in the Cabaret Theater, which was Martinson Hall. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but we did uh, David Man Mamet's The Water Engine. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We did John Guare's Landscape of the Body. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, so we, we brought we're all, all, we're all, all right. Saki Shange, you know, uh, she, did, she did a show where the Mississippi meets the Amazon. So you guys were just doing musicals. You were doing straight plays. Oh, you we were doing plays, yeah. plays yeah. 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 Now, what people don't realize about us is that we have a real solid background in theater mm. and in musicals. So why did you not wind up staying in this business? Why did you not wind didn't up? make a living. Really? Yeah. For all those, you couldn't? No. And also, I think there was a desire at that time to reach, you know, we were working at the public with those very small theaters, mm -hmm. and we thought, hmm, wouldn't it be great to reach millions of people? And when we went out to Hollywood to make movies and do TV shows, we were able to take our theater background, and you know, on TV we did Gypsy with Bette Midler, yeah, yeah. and uh, Rodgers and Hammerstein's Cinderella with Whitney Houston and Brandy and Whoopi and Bernadette Peters. Bernadette Peters, and then we did Annie with Kathy Bates, right? And, uh, and Victor Garber, and first film for Kristen Chenoweth. Right. And but when you guys were here now, I mean, when do you sort of look at each other and say, "We, we can't make a living here. Let's." pick up and move to Hollywood? I mean, had you had offers in Hollywood? Yeah, we had an opportunity. Sort of we we, yeah. we met with Peter Goober, oh, and yeah. Peter was running Casablanca Record and Filmworks at the time, and he wanted to start a theater division in New York, and he also wanted to turn us into producers doing film and TV. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of a, a, a very, very good match at the time, and that started everything in terms of uh, the move to, to the West Coast. And so what do you find when you go from your, your extensive theater background, suddenly you're thrust into Hollywood and the movie business and the dynamic of the movies? Where ah, decadence. <laughs> <laughs> A hole in the Hollywood uh -huh. hills. <laughs> Finally. It actually, it actually was horrible. Because <laughs> we, uh, it was a really bad time because we would go to uh, studios and we'd have ideas to do movie musicals and they'd literally kick us out. Huh, really? They'd say, the audience is not interested in musicals, um, it's passe, it's over, that era is gone, mm -hmm. and you know, you're wasting our time, get out. So we got thrown out of everyone's office. And then instead of getting discouraged, we thought, okay, so it's not going to work right now on the big screen. Let's do TV. And that's when we came up with doing Gypsy with Bette Midler. Right. And so we, we got into that door. Mm. And through that door, we and had so much success on TV with those musicals that that opened the door for features. But, you know, when we look back at our career, just in terms of this whole renaissance in movie musicals, we always like to credit Bette Midler, because if Bette had not said yes to doing Gypsy, it yeah. would never have happened. Right, right. So, thank you, Bette. Mm, fascinating. Yeah. And then um, Chicago comes along, and suddenly 
after years of studios saying movie musicals are finished and over, suddenly everybody's rushing to do mu movie well, musicals. Well, it was really interesting, the whole Chicago situation, because we discovered uh, a young choreographer by the name of Rob Marshall. Right. Yeah, sure. We knew him here. Little Me, I believe. That's, little right. That's, right. That's, That's right. right. That's right. His first solo directing and choreographing. And, and, but we hired him as a choreographer on Cinderella. Uh -huh. And then we watched him during the filming, and we thought the work was extraordinary. The way he worked with actors, the way he worked with the cameramen, mm. the lighting, all of that. We said, He's a director. So the next show we were going to do was Annie for TV, and we went to him and convinced him uh, to direct Annie. Yeah, originally he said no. And he really? said, and the, the reason he said no, which is kind of the big irony, is that um, Nick Heitner was going to direct the movie version of Chicago at that time with Goldie Hawn. Oh. And Madonna. And, and Madonna. And he went to Rob to say, I would like you to choreograph the movie. <laughs> so he had to choose between choreographing Chicago for Nick Heitner or directing and choreographing Annie. And we said, how many opportunities are there going to be for you to direct and choreograph a film? How funny things work out. But then That's when he the ended up directing Annie, yes. Harvey Weinstein was watching Annie with his kids <laughs> and said, who the hell is this guy, Rob Marshall, brought him in. Yeah. And the rest is history because... After Chicago being in development at Miramax for 10 years. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It was forever. There. Rob came in with the concept, which was that all, every, all the musical numbers were seen through Roxy Hart. Mm. You know? Is that I, trend towards uh, movie musicals still, still going strong now? Because Hairspray was a hit. Yep. Um, and it was the, the way it works in that business, that once you have one show that doesn't work, then all of a sudden it gets cold yeah. again? Is that how yeah. it sort of goes? Good. You're as good as your last picture. You yeah, know, right, it's like, exactly. Good kinda, as your last column. Yeah. <laughs> kind of, but, you know, luckily, I mean... Other people then did Mamma Mia, which made six hundred and fifty million dollars. Yeah, the most successful movie musical of, of all, all time. time. Of all time. So yeah. 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 Oh yeah. And and I, Dream I Girls did very well. Yeah. I mean, so there were a, a succession of and other. And Sweeney Todd. Sweeney Todd did, very did well. respectably. Mm -hmm. So what's the next one you guys are going to do? Well, we're going to do a couple of original musicals. So we original movies. Original. Yeah, original. Oh, well, that's musicals. very audacious. Yeah, as, that is as, audacious. Yeah. As 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 opposed to doing a, a Broadway adaptation. So yeah. right now we have nothing in the works in terms of an of an adaptation of a Broadway show. We have one big movie musical at Universal Pictures and one at 20th Century Fox, and we're developing them right now. So I I think that when they're ready, we will make them. So we're excited though because yeah. the same way as we started. Uh, back on Broadway by doing revivals, we want to develop original uh, stage musicals, right. and we want to and we want to uh, develop plays, right. and and start presenting new work. Right, uh, uh, doing doing the revivals was kind of a plan to kind of establish our credibility in the theater, and then to kind of have a basis, and then to go on from there. Now, you said something I, that struck me when we first met on the set of uh, Smash. Um, Besides uh, the other stuff? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For full disclosure. Uh, I wasn't um, uh, all that kind to, to promise the promises, uh, but I loved how to succeed. <laughs> uh, I'd written some sort of gossipy columns, and you said something that struck me. You said, you know, you guys, you guys love the theater. Yeah. Very and you went so. out to Hollywood, but you really felt, yeah. oh, you always wanted to come back to yeah. the theater. But when you came back, you were surprised at how kind of vicious and nasty the theater could be. Is, is I think the major change, if you said, okay, compare your life when you were working for Joe Papp and what the theater was in New York in those days versus the theater today, I think the major change that's happened are the blogs, the theater, the chat rooms. Yeah. And I think that um, what's happened with them is that you know a lot of people say, oh, just don't read them. But the, the reality is that people do read them. Yeah. Um, you know, we've even spoken to theater critics, legitimate theater critics, and we said to them, uh, do you read them? And they say, yes. Yeah. And are you influenced by them? And they said, well, we try not to be, but they are. So the thing is, you have a bunch of people who are, you know, I think we're, this is a country right now that is filled with rage. And you can watch it in the uh, U.S. Senate between Republicans and Democrats. You can watch it everywhere. Um, this rage has infiltrated the country, and especially the internet, because you're anonymous. Yeah. Uh, you can say whatever you want about anybody, and as disparaging as you want, and rip people apart, and taint the waters. 
like we were thinking back like we had just started working at the public theater and Michael Bennett had just done Chorus Line. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now when you think about that workshop and that experience on Chorus Line with Michael, he wouldn't have been able to do Chorus Line like that today because he was working in privacy. Right. He was able to develop it uh, alone in a closed, in a cocoon mm -hmm. and nobody was writing about it, nobody knew what he was up to and then when it was ready he unleashed it, and 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 you have the element of surprise, but, which but, is key but, in the in exactly. Theater. Yes, but let us not blame the bloggers. I think that Michael Riedel would have single-handedly shut down Chorus Line. I mean, I don't. I, I, I mean, I hope I, not. I, mean, I, hope, I, I, hope I, I hope I have some taste. I, see, I, mean, I simply yeah, want to yeah. say yes. There's I all might, these bloggers out there, but you're sitting across. I might have across. shut down ballroom, but not, <laughs> <laughs> not, not Chorus Line. I mean, please, that's scandal. <laughs> Scandal. <laughs> but, but, but you're sitting across from the key tanker. Let's not, you know, let's not blame yeah. the bloggers. That they're that that in the in the press and you put your name on it. Yeah. In the in the key New York Post, one of the major three newspapers, you've got somebody who's go, takes shots very easily at shows coming in, yeah. which you've experienced. Yeah, very yeah, much so. Yeah. But there's always been a Walter Winchell idea yeah. in the theater yeah. world. Is I mean, it's, it, of, it, you're right, but it's, it's also <laughs> it's also different in that. If Michael writes a column, it's a column, and it, it stings yes. when it comes out, obviously. Um, on the other hand, when you're w reading something 24 hours a day, that, you know, it's like Dan Radcliffe, when we opened How to Succeed, you know, he said to us, he's, he's the most brilliant kid we've ever met yeah. in our lives, uh, and he's an amazing, amazing person. And he said to us, you know, the first day, I went to the theater blogs and I read them, and he said, "I will never do it again." Right. The rest of my life, and he said, "Do you know why? Because it's like opening the door and going into a room where everyone hates you." Yeah. Now, why would you go into that room again? Yeah, yeah, I mean that that's when it comes into a personal responsibility. About I mean the actors are much more sensitive than the business people. I think it's okay to go after the business people, but the actors. Not so much. Well, I think, in, uh, to m amount of feeble defense uh, of my <laughs> colleagues, uh, you know, we, we in the press, we only tend to go after actors when there is what might be termed, and usually it comes from the production itself, bad behavior, where an actor is right. really out of line mm -hmm. backstage. Right. And I can tell you, sometimes people have felt that, you know, an actor who's, I won't name anyone, but mm -hmm. someone is really out of line, and because they're of a, such a level, uh -huh. they can't be controlled. And sometimes the only place to go to is embarrass them in the press. It's I not just it. been me, but I it's been it. Alex Witchell and Walter oh, yeah. Winchell. And that can be Absolutely. an effective thing. I mean, I don't review Daniel Radcliffe's performance right. on the first right. the first preview, because that's just unfair to the art form itself. Right, exactly, exactly. But, you know, I I, I think that what, what Craig and I like to, to do, try and do, is to protect the actor. And I think, well, and, yeah. and yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, listen, guys, it's been you an see, I can't, I'm not going to quote anything that Michael's gratuitously said about actors who weren't evincing bad behavior. <laughs> <laughs> because I don't want to repeat. Night. Thank, Thank you very much. Right. 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 <laughs> um, I just want to ask you, Craig, um, this book, uh, which you wrote in, what, 1973? 73, yeah. Um, uh, why and do you, you updated it. Yeah, I, update, I updated it like five times. Why do you think it's endured so well? Because there have been a slew of Sondheim books since then. I figured out that Steve Sondheim was going to be who Steve Sondheim was going to be. Mm -hmm. And people didn't know. Like when I was writing the book, I'd say, he's this person, this person, that person. And people would go, huh? Mm. And I'd say, he wrote the lyrics for West Side Story. And they go, oh. <laughs> but at that time, that was like how they knew him. Right, right. And I would be being at the right place at the right time, I got to interview and to speak to Ethel Merman, Zero Mostel, you know, uh, Bert Shevelov and, Bert and, Shevelov, and, and uh, Jerry Robbins. Jerry Robbins and Michael Bennett and I mean on and on and on and on. Bert Shevelov, who knew Steve maybe as as well oh, as anybody. Oh, anybody. They were so close. And I got to spend literally a week with Leonard Bernstein. And those people all then were gone in minutes. Yeah. And as a result, I was able, I had the benefit of, of having all of their input and their information in this book. And where, people are quite candid, I think. Oh, the I, sure. that, that's the other thing that was surprising to me. Mm -hmm. I thought they would be sort of careful. They weren't. Mm -hmm. They weren't. They, they completely went on full blast and they told the truth.
just like the characters in Smash. Just like That's the characters right in Smash. <laughs> How nice to wrap there it all back, back to the beginning. <laughs> all right, my, my, uh, my, my, uh, my new friends, Craig Zayden <laughs> <laughs> and Neil. See how we all get along here. Oh, in the yeah. World. <laughs> Craig Zayden and Neil Marin, the producers of Smash on NBC, uh, 10 o'clock on Monday nights. Thank you guys for being our guest tonight. Oh, thank thanks you. for inviting us. Thank you. You can sign up for viewer updates at theatertalk.org. Or you can Twitter us. Our thanks to the Friends of Theatre Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Eleanor Naylor Dana Charitable Trust, the Alan S. Gordon Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency. We welcome your questions or comments for Theatre Talk. Thank you and good night.